and welcome to the American Society of Echo E3 lecture series. My name is Lucy Safi and I am Director of Interventional Echocardiography at Hackensack University Medical Center and Chair of the ASC Emerging Echo Enthusiasts, also known as E3 Special Interest Group. This special interest group provides an opportunity for early career physicians, sonographers, and trainees who are interested in echocardiography to present, interact, and discuss echocardiographic topics. Each lecture is formatted as a 30-minute didactic lecture followed by a panel discussion. On the panel will be two moderators and an expert in the field. During the discussion section, the panelists will also answer audience questions. So please enter your questions in the Q&A box below. This virtual lecture series will be recorded and later available online via the ASC E3 website. To join ASC E3 Special Interest Group, log into your ASC account and under Update My Profile, click Specialty Interest Groups and then click E3. Today's lecture is on contrast echocardiography. Joining me today as co-moderator is Dr. Pruvi Purwani. Dr. Purwani is a multimodality imager and assistant professor of medicine at Loma Linda University Health in Loma Linda, California. She has been faculty for the ASC scientific sessions and a member of the Women in Echo Council. Welcome Dr. Purwani and thank you, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Dr. Safi, delighted and honored to be here. Our physician expert is Dr. Sharon Mulvey. Dr. Mulvey is professor of medicine at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She is co-director of the Women's Heart Health Clinic at the Maritime Heart Center and director of Focus in Internal Medicine Program at Queen Elizabeth II Health Sciences Center. She is a clinical and investigative cardiologist recognized nationally and internationally for her research and education focused on non-invasive cardiovascular imaging, specifically contrast echo and myocardial perfusion imaging in women, cardio-oncology, and point-of-care ultrasound. She is the current vice president and incoming president of the Canadian Society of Echo. She's a member of the board of directors for the inter International Contrast Ultrasound Society and current ASC Scientific Sessions Chair for 2022. Thank you for joining us today as expert panelist. Thank you, Dr. Safi, and it's just a pleasure to be here with you all today. Our guest speaker today is Kristen Bullock. Kristen is an advanced cardiac sonographer and fellow of the American Society of Echo. She is currently the Echo Lab Manager for the Scripps Clinic in La Jolla, California. Kristen is passionate about quality improvement, process improvement, and supporting sonographer education and career growth. She is very involved in the American Society of Echo and currently serves on the IRT Committee. She is co-chair for the Public, Public Relations Committee and graduate of the inaugural ASC Leadership Academy class. Welcome, Kristen. We look forward to your presentation and you may share your slides. Thank you, Lucy. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Today, I'm going to be talking to you all about ultrasound enhancing agents. And these are my disclosures. And so um, today we're going to define what ultrasound enhancing agents are. We're going to discuss the indications for when to use them. Um, dosing and administration, uh, the safety, the barriers that we see in many institutions. Um, and then we're going to wrap up with the fun part, which is really just optimization of our images when we're using UEAs. So the term um, ultrasound enhancing agent can really be used interchangeably with the term contrast. Technically, Definity, Opison, and Lumison are all contrast agents and are labeled as such in their package inserts. Um, but we know that the term contrast is often associated with iodinated contrast used in, radio used in radiology. Um, and some patients may have had reactions to that type of contrast or they have um, renal problems, so there's a concern. Um, and so this may lead to uh, patients refusing uh, the contrast agent or even nurses or providers refusing uh, to give it to the patients if they're uneducated in it. Um, and so because of this um, conflicting term, in 2018, the ASC guidelines update replaced the term contrast with the less conflicting term ultrasound enhancing agents. And so I'll use the two terms interchangeably throughout the presentation. So what are ultrasound enhancing agents? Uh, we know they're micro bubbles. 
They're made of a high molecular weight gas contained within a flexible shell. Uh, the gas improves the stability and the persistence of the bubbles. If you're using um, Optizon or Definity, uh, you're going to have a perfluorocarbon gas, and Lumison will have a sulfur hexafluoride. The shell of the bubble is very flexible. Um, and if you have uh, Definity or Lumison, you have a phospholipid shell. And with Optizon, you have an albumin shell. There's re reduced solubility and diffusivity. And basically what that means is it doesn't dissolve very easily and the bubbles don't spread out. And then the gas liquid interface augments the ultrasound reflection. The size of the bubbles um, is 1.1 to four and a half micro, uh, micrometers meters in diameter. And this uh, allows for passage through the pulmonary and systemic capillary beds. It has a similar velocity profile to red blood cells and it's eliminated through from the body uh, with the gas escaping from the lungs. So when uh, ultrasound enhancing agents are in the blood, the returning signals are dependent on the mechanical index of the transmitted signal sent out. And so when ultrasound waves hit microbubbles, the microbubbles oscillate asymmetrically and they compress with increased pressure and they expand when the pressure is lowered. It's important to know that the expansion phase is um, a lot longer than the compression phase. And this generates a harmonic signal that is called nonlinear. And it's that nonlinear signal that allows for differentiation of the surrounding tissue uh, from the microbubble signal. And then over the years, machines have really evolved from harmonics to single and multiple subtraction techniques. It's the detection of nonlinear responses from the UEAs with better tissue cancellation. So the only FDA approved um, indication for the use of UEAs is to opacify the left ventricular chamber and to improve delineation of the LV endocardial borders. Um, should be used when there's suboptimal images um, or when you need to assess LV contractility. And suboptimal images are um, defined as when you cannot see uh, two or more endocardial segments well in any of the three apical views. So there are many indications for using ultrasound enhancing agents. Many are considered off-label. Um, you want to use them for quantification of LV volume and ejection fraction, assessing regional wall motion, patients coming in with chest pain, or um, pre-AICD placement, where that ejection fraction is really important. Um, we use it for stress echo a lot, even though it's considered technically off-label. Um, and then we use ultrasound enhancing agents to enhance the spectral Doppler, Doppler signal um, to rule out or better define any intracardiac masses like rule out thrombus in the apex. Um, we use it for ap apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as well as non-compaction cardiomyopathy, LV aneurysm and pseudoaneurysm. We even use it for RV assessments. Um, we use it on TEE to assess the atrium, the left atrial appendage, rule out clot there. Um, we do perfusion uh, myocardial assessment. Uh, we use ultrasound enhancing agents during alcohol septal ablations for HCM patients, and we even use it for vascular imaging. So the Intersocietal Accreditation Commission, or IAC, um, has standards that most of our labs all follow. And those standards state that contrast is indicated for use when two contiguous segments are not visualized as it provides greater accuracy in determining LV function. Um, contrast must be used, and if this is not accomplished with harmonic optimal imaging. If use of contrast does not provide adequate visualization, alternate imaging must be considered. Um, and so contrast should be used in the presence of poor endocardial border definition for chamber quantification, um, LV volumes, ejection fractions, and assessment of regional wall motion. And then the IAC states that if contrast is used, there must be a written policy for the use of the agents. If contrast is not able to be used, there must be a policy for alternative imaging. Um, contrast studies should be strongly considered when patients are technically difficult. Contrast agents may be used in conjunction with treadmill, bicycle, pacing, or pharmacological stress to optimize endocardial border definition or to enhance Doppler signals. And it's also important to note that when you're going through your accreditation, or your reaccreditation, um, you can even use normal stress echo cases as long as they've used contrast, which is kind of nice. So it's 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 good to use. Okay, 
So what is the impact of a suboptimal echo? Well, it can lead to misdiagnosis, which could lead to suboptimal therapy. Um, unnecessary downstream testing can surely happen, increase in morbidity and mortality. And all this adds up to really just poor quality care, increased length of stay and readmissions, and increased cost. Um, there are three um, FDA approved agents uh, in the United States currently, and that is Lumison, Definity, and Optison. And so those are the agents we'll be talking about. And all these uh, contrast agents are very similar in some ways and different in other ways. The contraindications to using ultrasound enhancing agents are really just a hypersensitivity or allergy to anything that um, is, makes up those bubbles. And so with Definity, that would be a hypersensitivity to perflutrin or polyethylene glycol or PEG. Um, with Lumison, that would be a hypersensitivity to sulfur hexafluoride or PEG. And with Optison, that would be a hypersensitivity to perflutrin, albumin, blood, or blood products. And that's really important to remember that intracardiac shunt is no longer a contraindication. Um, do you want to touch briefly on the hypersensitivity to polyethylene glycol? Um, this year in April, there was a new FDA uh, contraindication uh, for Definity and Lumison that revolved around PEG. And it, it occurred because there were 11 significant adverse events that happened over two decades in which the FDA thinks could possibly be related to PEG. Uh, it's important to note that PEG is in over a thousand common medications as well as in cosmetics and cleaning product products. Um, PEG has always been a part of the phospholipid shell in Definity and Lumison. And there's uh, safety data, data on millions of patients over two decades and all that is unchanged. Um, so the appropriate use of Definity and Lumison should not change. The only thing that should change is that patients must now be screened for hypersensitivity to PEG. Um, and this should include asking about hypersensitivity to colon prep products and laxatives, as many can contain PEG. A little bit of the history of um, the safety for ultrasound enhancing agents is that back in 2007, the FDA issued a black box warning for optosan and Definity. And this um, made it so you had to closely monitor for 30 minutes um, any high-risk patients that received optosan or Definity. So patients with hypertension or unstable cardiopulmonary conditions. So basically all of our patients that we, that we use it on. Um, and so, you know, a lot of safety studies were performed and this led to the removal of these monitoring requirements. Um, and the study showed that not only uh, were, was the contrast very safe, but it also improved patient outcomes. And so all three of the UEAs are proven to have excellent safety profiles. The current warning reads, serious cardiopulmonary reactions, including fatalities, have occurred uncommonly during or following contrast agent administration. Most serious reactions occur within 30 minutes of administration. Assess all patients for the presence of any condition that precludes contrast administration and always have resuscitation equipment and trained personnel readily available. Um, I really like this statement from the ASE guidelines uh, UEA writing group, which stated life-threatening reactions are rare, less than one in 10,000. And this residual warning should not be considered an excuse to withhold contrast. So it's, it's proven to be safe. And while things can happen, it's quite rare and worse things can happen if you don't use it and you miss something. Um, so anaphylactic reactions are very rare. There's a rare anaphylactoid reaction called CARPA um, that occurs in approximately one to 4% of patients, generally happens at the level of the injection site due to the liposomes. One of the most common ones we've all heard of is back pain, which is a more common side effect with Definity. Um, its cause is unknown, but it's hypothesized to be either related to uh, the CARPA type reaction, or it's thought that some of the lipid bubbles may actually stick to the renal glomerular cells, and this releases, releases a compound that triggers pain receptors. Um, but they have proven that there is actually no uh, obstruction to flow taking place in the kidneys. It's really just the pain receptors um, that are going off. Um, so when this happens, you want to discontinue the injection of the UEA and monitor vital system, uh, signs. 
You uh, don't need to treat them with Benadryl or anything like that. It will, will resolve uh, spontaneously within minutes. And minutes can sometimes feel like hours when they're in really bad pain, but just hang in there, it'll go away. Um, all labs that use ultrasound enhancing agents need to have allergy kits readily av available. And the sonographers and the nurses really need to be able to recognize when somebody is actually having a reaction. The last safety part I wanna to touch on is for ECMO. So some ECMO circuits have um, bubble sensing safety systems, which will result in the whole system shutting down if the alarm is not addressed within a six sec second window. And that can actually uh, be fatal to a patient who is fully reliant on the ECMO system. And so it's really, really important to have a well-established process and very careful communication with the whole clinical team um, and the perfusionist so that bubble sensor can be disabled while you administer the ultrasound enhancing agent. Barriers are very common, um, unfortunately, and this is a big reason as to why ultrasound enhancing agents are still significantly underutilized. Um, one of the issues is IV access. We need that. Um, in patients, that's not a big deal, but in the outpatient environment, it is. Um, and so one thing that has been helpful is that the ASC and the SCMS uh, support IV training and administration of contrast for sonographers. Um, and mainly the barriers that are the most common revolve around poor processes and just a lack of proper training. Um, so you want to think, you know, how is it being ordered? Is there a standing order? In my institution, every echo is ordered with ultrasound enhancing agent as needed. And it's up to the sonographer to determine if they can see two or more segments or not. Um, or, you know, or do you, does somebody have to go get an actual paper order from a doctor? That's something we used to have to do. That's a big, you know, time delay. So how it's ordered is important. Um, how are the nurses educated about this? You know, are they, uh, do they take competencies on how to administrate it? Um, that's another, you know, part of the delay is you go and you have a nurse and you ask them to do it, they don't know what it is. Now somebody has to teach them, oftentimes the sonographer, and that takes time. And then just the overall wait time, you know, if you have a nurse uh, who needs to push it for you, they're busy, they're helping other patients and doing other things, and so that causes delays. And then also, where is the ultrasound enhancing agent stored? Are you carrying it with you? Is it stored in the Pixis on your floor? Or do you have to walk a half a mile back to the echo lab to get it? Um, I could tell you that, you know, if a sonographer has to wait 30 or even 60 minutes sometimes to get a nurse to be available to give them the contrast or has to, you know, go far to get it, if it's a big inconvenience, it's unfortunately just not going to get used as it should. And, and again, things are going to get missed. Um, there is obviously a cost to using ultrasound enhancing agents. However, it is reimbursed in the outpatient setting. So you make money on it in an outpatient environment. Um, the inpatient environment usually has the diagnosis related group payment system. Um, but it can be argued that you actually still save money um, in this environment because you have less downstream testing and improved diagnosis in a, in a faster time period. So in 2015, the SDMS um, came out with a scope of practice for sonographers. And you can see there are a lot of participating organizations, um, including the ASC, CCI, ARDMS. And in this uh, scope of practice document, they state that with appropriate education and training, the sonographer uses proper technique for IV insertion and administers intravenous contrast according to facility protocol. And so they're in full support of that um, if it's done the right way. But you do have to keep in mind that any sort of state laws or institutional rules um, do trump this document. And so um, you do have to go through your own risk management department to determine if sonographer injection is possible in your institution. All right, so now let's talk about optimization. Okay, what should good ultrasound enhancing agent images look like? Well, you want homogeneous opacification of the LV from the base of the apex. You want strong microbubble signals, so you want the blood pool to be nice and bright and white. 
and you want the myocardium to be perfused. You want to see the little micro bubbles within the myocardium. You don't want it to be just black, black and white. You want to see blood within the tissue. So I hate to break it to everybody, but ultrasound physics actually does matter, both in non-contrast imaging and contrast imaging. And so we have to remember um, all of our, our physics when we talk about optimization. And so first, I just want to talk about the contrast preset on the machine. So the contrast preset is really just the starting point. Um, but power, frequency, gain, compression, frame rate, focal zone, all those things still need to be optimized. Um, we know that power, frequency, and focus do affect how the microbubbles respond to the ultrasound, um, where gain and compression should be adjusted uh, to optimize image quality. It's very, very, very important to remember that these settings are different for every patient. Um, I always say, would you ever do a non-contrast echo, so just a regular echo, without adjusting your frequency, gain, compression, frame rate, and focal zone? No. And so the same goes for contrast imaging. You have to um, adjust the picture uh, based on, on the patient. Um, also keep in mind that not all presets on these machines were programmed to optimal settings. And the settings will actually vary depending on what agent you're using. Okay, so first let's talk about power or mechanical index, MI. This is the strength of the ultrasound wave. It's the measure of the acoustic power output from the transducer, and it's often refers to, referred to as a transmit power. And this uh, can actually have the greatest impact on microbubble response and overall image quality. Um, so non-contrast adult imaging uses a high MI setting so that you can actually see the heart. Um, but with contrast imaging, you really need to keep the MI low enough as to not destruct the microbubbles, but still high enough so you can see the heart. Uh, once you get to an MI of 0.8, you are essentially popping the bubbles. Um, and what you'll see is a bunch of swirling and just incomplete opacification of the left ventricle. Um, and again, MI settings are going to vary per patient, per ultrasound system, and per agent that you're using. Um, and my personal thing is that when I'm in the parasternals, I like to even crank up the power even more than normal because you really just need a little bit more oomph to get through the RV, through the septum, all the way to that back infralateral wall in the far field. So what's the best MI setting? Well, we know it should be at 0.8 or below, right? Because then we're popping bubbles at 0.8. Um, but you need to ask yourself, are you getting a strong homogenous signal from the microbubbles? Um, rather than focusing on 0 0.8, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, rather than focusing on the number, you need to really ask yourself, are all the endocardial segments clearly visualized? Um, it, if you're getting poor microbubble signals with poor definition of the endocardium, you can't see anything, well, then you need to try to crank up the power so you can actually see the cardiac structures. If you're getting a bunch of swirling again and the incomplete opacification, well, then you may be getting microbubble destruction and to try to decrease the power. So you're just changing your knobs based on what you're seeing on the screen. Um, and then keep in mind that frequency, depth, focal zone, and sector size all do affect the MI. All right, so here's an example of the same patient, same view. Literally nothing's changed except for changing the power. So the first one on the left, you have your MI is uh, too low, you're at 0.12, and you really just don't have clearly defined walls there. Uh, the next one is kind of an optimal MI for this patient at 0.19. And then you have the next one, which the MI is too high. We're at 0.48. And on this patient, that's really making uh, a lot of swirling happen within the cavity. And then the last image is we're actually completely out of the contrast setting here. And you're at an MI of 1.2, which is what we often image at without contrast, and uh, we really just lose all endocardial definition and see a bunch of swirling contrast. Now let's talk a little bit about frequency. So frequency controls how deep you can image. It's the penetration of the ultrasound waves. It controls image resolution. Um, we know that our high transmit frequency gives us the best, the highest resolution, um, but less depth of the ultrasound wave penetration. And we know that the low transmit frequency has greater depth of ultrasound wave penetration, but can give us lower image resolution. 
Um, but we also know that uh, when ultrasound waves need to travel further, like with in our obese patients that we oftentimes need contrast on, lower frequency ultrasound waves are ideal. And then uh, the bubble itself has its own resonant frequency. And, uh, and that frequency and the microbubble radius are inversely squared. So here's a change uh, in the frequency. And so here we do the, you know, if you're on a Phillips machine, you're gonna do gen pen res. And uh, the first image to the left, you're on pen, uh, which is the lower frequency level. Um, and honestly, all these images are, are, are pretty good, but um, you'll see that the one with the highest frequency uh, on the right on the res actually has the finest detail of the endocardium. Okay, focal zone. So we know that the focus is the narrowest area of the ultrasound beam. It has the greatest ultrasound intensity, and thus this is the area where there can be maximum bubble disruption. Um, the initial placement of the focus should be at the mitral valve level, and this really allows for optimal visualization of the whole uh, left ventricle with a nice homogeneous appearance, uh, minimizes bubble disruption, um, and so the focus uh, is usually good at the mitral level. There is an exception to the rule. Um, so we know that the focus is also the area that gives us the finest detail. And so when there's an area that we wanna actually focus on, you bring the focus up to that area. For example, if you have um, an LV thrombus where you wanna see it a little bit more clearly, or if you have an apical hypertroph, um, then you can surely move the focus to the region that you're trying to look at. Um, here's an example of a two-chamber view and uh, top left, you just see a regular two-chamber, not very clearly defined uh, borders of the anterior wall. And then the sonographer does a great job and does a sweep up in the apex and uh, sees a possible thrombus there. And then in the bottom, you see there um, is clearly um, an avascular mass consistent with a thrombus and you'll see the focus was brought up to that area and it really gives you like a better definition of the thrombus and there is a little wall motion abnormality in that region and you can see that much clearer. Okay, gain, compression, and frame rate. So know that gain and compression do not affect the microbubbles at all. That's something that the machine is doing. Um, so we know that gain boosts the amplification of the received echoes, um, and you can adjust your TGCs so that you have myocardial and LV opacification appearing even from the base of the apex, um, and this typically requires uh, increasing the TGCs a little bit more in the near field. And then compression or dynamic range. This adjusts the range of shades of gray displayed in the 2D image. I like to think of it as making my image either a little bit more smooth or crispy looking. And then frame rate determines the number of frames per unit of time and may affect microbubble disruption if it's set too high. Okay, same patient, same window, all that's being changed in, in these pictures is the gain. So on the, the first image, we see the gain is way too low. It's very dark. We don't get any definition of the endocardial borders, except maybe in the apex there. In the middle, we have our optimal gain. Uh, we can see everything. We can see the bubbles within the myocardium. Uh, we see bright white in the blood pool. That's what we want. And then the last image, the gain is too high. Everything's really bright, um, and it's really just washing everything out. So it's not as clear. Then we have compression and dynamic range. So uh, compression, the one, the first image on the left, um, again, it's it's very, I say crispy looking, but it's just it's it's too uh, it's too low. In the middle, we have um, the compression is optimal. Again, we have that perfect looking picture, and then the compression gets turned too high, and it gets again very washed out look very kind of similar effect that gain has, but in, in a different way. Okay, let's talk about some important parts of administering the ultrasound enhancing agent. Um, so the speed of the administration uh, is really important to make sure you get that homogenous picture of the left ventricle. Um, if you give too fast of a push, you get something called attenuation. 
And what attenuation is, it's, it's acoustic shadowing due to the inability of the imaging system to compensate for the UEA. There's a reduction in the amplitude of the signal, right? So you get a blackout. It's caused by a high concentration of microbubbles in the near field and results of a shadowing in the distal structures. Um, and you'll usually just see a dark black shadow in the mid to basal uh, LV cavity. Um, it could also be caused by a high concentration of UEA. So um, you may see this, uh, your whole image is blacked out and you look over and whoops, the nurse pushed all 10 cc's at once. Um, and so if you, if you have too much, that's an issue too, that'll cause attenuation. Um, and so really a slower injection rate can always allow for a more uniform filling of the LV and that's what we want. Here's an example of attenuation. So the first picture, um, you see kind of a shadow there in the mid to base LV, and then you wait, just wait it out, just wait 20 seconds later, and there's a little bit of attenuation still left, um, but uh, it looks a lot better, and we can actually see all the endocardial segments much more clearly, especially at the basal level. And so you can also give too slow of a push. If you're seeing swirling and incomplete opacification, one problem may be that the push is too slow and it's just not coming in uh, as you need it to. And so this results when the rate of the bubble destruction exceeds the rate of the bubble replenishment. And so really you just need to push more, uh, more agent. Um, sometimes swirling is unavoidable, like when somebody has a really low ejection fraction. Um, and then sometimes decreasing the frequency or MI can really help to reduce that swirling. Um, so swirling can be caused by quite a few different things. Um, here's an example of what swirling looks like. In this scenario, swirling could re really be from multiple different things. It could be too slow of an injection. It could be that the EF is terrible and so blood is literally swirling in there. Um, or it could be, you know, our MI is 0.3 here. That's kind of high. Um, so it could be the too high of an MI. Um, we're in the gen setting for our frequency, so going down to 10 could definitely help. So, um, and then sometimes, honestly, you can do, you can change all those things that we just talked about and you still have swirling. Um, so you just do your best and the goal, even if you have some swirling within the chamber, as long as you're seeing the endocardial borders, that's all that really matters. So there are, of course, exceptions. Um, situations in which you want to give a slower push uh, is when somebody has a really high heart rate or really hyperdynamic function. Um, and sometimes you even want to give a fast push on purpose. So if they have a really slow heart rate, it's going to take forever to get to the heart. And so you want to kind of push it along. Um, you may get some attenuation, but that's okay. Um, and then if somebody, again, like the prior picture, has poor LV function, um, actually giving a little bit of a faster push will, will help fill that in. Another thing you can do is you can um, lift the patient's arm up after injection, um, or you can follow it with a saline flush, um, again, just to kind of push it along. Um, and if you get attenuation, don't worry too much about that, because we know that, again, if we wait it out and we're patient, that part will go away. Um, when somebody has really, really low LV function, I personally like to give a really fast push, um, and I don't worry about the attenuation at all. I like to kind of just zoom in on the apex, and even if my whole mid to base is totally blacked out, I at least am able to light up that apex, prove there's no clot there, um, because sometimes once you wait for that to go away, everything's swirling again, um, and you can't really tell. So it's okay to give a fast push in certain situations and a slow push in certain situations. Okay, so in summary, we know that um, UEAs are safe. Um, the indication is to opacify the LV chamber and improve delineation of the LV endocardial border. There are many useful indications, many are off-label. Um, proper dosing and administration should be followed for the best imaging results. Overcoming common barriers is very important, and implementing proper optimization techniques should be followed for best imaging results. These are my references, and thank you guys for having me. Thank you so much, Kristen. That was excellent. Thank you so much for your helpful hints at the end, especially. I thought those were very educational, and, and I really, really thought that was wonderful. 
Um, I'm looking forward to our discussion portion of this lecture now um, involving all of our panelists. Um, since we know each other so well, we prefer to refer to each other by our first name. And I actually encourage all of the uh, members in the audience to also write questions in the Q&A box below. I know a couple have already started to come through. Um, and I wanted to ask Sharon the first question actually uh, from Harry in the audience. He wants to know, is it safe to use contrast if a patient has a history of stroke or TIA with an unknown cause? Yes, and thank you, Harry, for that question, and thank you for joining us. Harry is very active, uh, one of our critical care echo um, enthusiasts as well as an E3 enthusiast, and uh, is very active on Twitter. So uh, nice to see you here tonight, Harry. Thank you. Um, as you know, it is uh, one of the things that we do uh, when we are trying to uh, sort out the differential diagnosis for a patient uh, with a TIA or stroke. One of the things that's done routinely is to give them agitated saline microbubbles, or not microbubbles, but agitated saline bubbles, right? And agitated saline bubbles are way bigger than um, microbubbles that are in commercial contrast agents. So um, there really are no reports uh, that have um, come out to my awareness at any rate uh, where microbubble agents have been a problem uh, with um, safety in patients that um, you're working up for a stroke or a TIA. Um, just the, and there are a few isolated reports with respect to agitated saline bubbles, though. Um, so, you know, um, I think that it's more of a technical question in the way of if you are going to use um, microbubble con commercial agent, uh, then you're not assessing for a shunt, obviously. You're, you know, looking for to define as. Uh, Kristen mentioned um, a clot perhaps in the uh, left atrial appendage or uh, help with uh, sorting out an intracardiac source of thrombus as a filling defect with the LV um, or other chamber enhancement. But um, the thing, the technical thing is to make sure you do the agitated saline contrast to exclude the right to left shunt before you use the microbubble contrast agent because of course, you know, it sticks around and you won't be able to have um, an accurate agitated saline um, injection. What, technically, Kristen, do you have anything to add on that? What, what, would you, what would your thoughts be? I mean, I just think that these are the patients where you want to use contrast the most are, are these exactly. types of patients. Yeah. Exactly. So it's, um, it's uh, considered to be an indication as opposed to a, a safety issue. I think Great. Sharon, on the same, um, you know, on the same kind of question, um, when we look at the guidelines, guidelines offer that, uh, you know, for patients with shunts as well as pulmonary hypertension, use of contrast agent is safe, um, right? Uh, I mean, there Great will be point. technical issues, but uh, are there, do you guys have any comments on that? That's an excellent point to emphasize that, you know, there, there is no uh, real concern uh, clinically with using these agents in the setting of shunts. Now, you know, um, the uh, black box warning had included both the things that you mentioned, uh, the shunts and the um, pulmonary hypertension issues, but both of those have been studied extensively, um, huge databases, and uh, there is uh, no uh, concern regarding those two issues. So, yeah, uh, and you don't have to do an agitated saline injection before you give a commercial contrast agent to rule out into cardiac shunt, which is what some people were sort of doing about 15 or you know, 10, year, 10 years mm -hmm. or so ago. Mm -hmm. It's not necessary to do that anymore, precisely. So I think we have a next question. Shout out to all my colleagues from Ecolab who have been attending and they have put some questions. So thank you, Vinuta, for asking this question. So the question is, are there any ongoing studies uh, or evolving indications for contrast or should the focus primarily shift to more utilization of contrast in the echo lab? Well, I'm happy to take a stab at that. Um, yes, the answer is yes, there's lots of ongoing um, cutting edge type research and you're absolutely right um, that it is, um, a essential component of an everyday clinical practice in our uh, echo lab to be able to utilize uh, microbubble um, contrast or ultrasound enhancing agents. And um, that's just bread and butter of echocardiographic practice. And we should be using it for the approved indication, which is you know, for LVO, uh, for um, intracardiac structure assessments, um, as very eloquently outlined in the excellent talk that uh, Kristen just gave. 
um, and in all of our guidelines documents. Um, but the, the, the real important thing is, is that even in our everyday practice, we use it way more as Kristen uh, stated as well in, you know, it's not specifically on label per se. Um, stress echo is really not you know, on the label, but neither is dobutamine, right? So, um, mm -hmm. but we clearly know that uh, that's uh, through a lot of investigative work that's been published work um, that I've been privileged to be part of some of it, um, that it, it has uh, benefits uh, clinically. So um, what are we doing, um, you know, even in the clinical setting, we should be using perfusion. There's a huge amount of benefit to be gained in, in perfusion uh, imaging uh, in patients in the emergency room with uh, chest pain. We can see whether there are uh, perfusion defects uh, in our stress testing. We can see um, even before we hit target, if there are areas that are having perfusion abnormalities, multivessel disease, uh, much easier to pick it up. Um, it, for characterizing intracardiac masses, um, are they likely to be... Um, uh, thrombus, then they wouldn't have any perfusion um, versus tumor. And is it benign or malignant? Uh, higher level perfusion with a malignant tumor, for example, and with a myxoma, just a little bit of perfusion. So it's very, very helpful in our everyday practice. Um, then beyond the really more exciting, um, you know, pushing the frontiers and the borders for research studies, I think is one of the questions, what the question was driving at, uh, is molecular imaging, uh, the utilization, uh, for example, of uh, loading microbubbles and delivering them and activating them by ultrasound release, um, mm -hmm. the whole field of something called theranostics, uh, which that kind of borders on, uh, sonothrombolysis to be able to, in patients that come uh, to the emergency room or even before the emergency room in the ambulance, there are studies going on to look at administering contrast agents and ultrasound in the ability to improve microvascular perfusion uh, well, not only to potentially um, dissolve clot, intra-luminal uh, clot, but also the big problem in uh, lack of uh, reperfusion in patients that do end up obviously going to BCI in an acute STEMI is that there's microvascular obstruction. And if you can uh, clear that by uh, clearing um, clot out of the microcirculation uh, by just applying um, the contrast agent and the uh, ultrasound. This is a lot of work has been done with Tom Porter and Wilson Mathias, uh, huge studies, um, that, well, evolving larger studies. Um, they've got a cute little acronym, which is the Hubble, I think it reminds me of the space uh, um, yeah. telescope, right? Uh, but it's uh, it applied uh, to um, the clinical setting of uh, sonothrombolysis. So lots of work going on in that direction and, and we could go on more but I don't want to spend the whole time on that so yes just um, <laughs> we, we there's lots of activity and we really need um, you know uh, young investigators to be enthusiastic about this area because there really is so much to do in the benefit as we all know of echo we can do it at the bedside and it, it's accessible and readily available and it's inexpensive and you know, it's really um, underutilized, but it has to, you have to have the appropriate training uh, so that you um, can, you, the technology, the technique is a little tricky uh, to, to get under your belt, but once you've got it, um, then it's really a wild, potentially widely available and applicable. So that's a long song and dance, but I, I hope I've covered the spectrum of, of where we go. And we do cover this, of course, in the guidelines documents. And uh, just a pitch too, we are revamping the contrast zone on the ASC website, and that will be hopefully ready kind of like um, late fall, maybe it'll push a little bit into the latter part of this year. And we'll have a lot of uh, additional resources there, there and to keep that up to date. Really exciting to find out, uh, to, you know, follow along and, and to see what, you know, some of these outcomes come out of these trials. Um, very interesting stuff. And, you know, talking about perfusion a little bit, I wanted to pivot to stress echo because I think it's a very interesting um, topic and I know that it's off-label, but um, I would love to hear some of um, your experience for all the members on the panel, really, you know, maybe starting with Kristen on how how do you train your sonographers to do the, you know, stress echo um, and and kind of moving along to, you know, maybe Sharon and Pravi can talk about, you know, their experiences on how best to optimize and, you know, which patients do they use flash for and, th and so forth. So, um, Kristen, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so um, the administration part and the timing is really important when it comes to treadmill stress echo. Um, and then some institutions do like a continuous infusion as well. 
Um, like, you know, we were talking about attenuation is caused when you have high heart rate, high cardiac output. Well, that's what you get when you put somebody on a treadmill or you give them, you know, dibutamine. Um, and so you get attenuation. Um, so it's really important. I always tell the nurse that I want them to, uh, I like one and a half to two cc's of the contrast agent that we use here. Um, I like that 45 to 60 seconds before they even get off the treadmill. And so you really have to work with the patient too, right? You have to prepare them for that. Like we're going to, we're going to be talking, tell me when you have only a minute left in you. Um, and we just do our best because I want that to kind of, you know, be through their system. So that when they come over to my table, there will be less attenuation. There won't be such a high concentration, uh, uh, in the left ventricle. Um, and then, um, I personally don't have a lot of experience with perfusion, but I think what's great about it is, um, you know, you can see perfusion defects before wall motion abnormalities. Um, and so, I mean, that's, that's really great information that, that you can get from that. Um, I'll let, uh, Dr. Mulvey talk more about perfusion. Yeah, actually, right. Sharon, before you take it, there is a question. So I'll just tie so that you can kind of answer everything. So uh, Dr. Patel is asking for treadmill stress echo. Can you share your experience if bolus or continuous uh, uh, infusion, what works better? And then the second question, which I think is very relevant, is once you give the contrast for LVO, how quickly uh, one can view the myocardial perfusion? So kind of tying both, the, both together. Great. Do you want me to um, take that one? Yeah, that'd be good. Oh, sure. Uh, so the, um, there are kind of several schools on this, and um, there are some perhaps, let's say, more practical approaches, and then there are some more um, really investigative, pure research required for quantitative analysis. So are we going to do a qualitative assessment of perfusion, or are we going to do a quantitative assessment? And most of the assessments we can do with our eyeball qualitatively, although certainly, you know, we've all, you know, been involved, some of us anyway, have been studies that have looked at quantification of perfusion, and we can actually be very comparable uh, to uh, other um, uh, relevant uh, techniques. So the, um, the important thing would be to have it set up to be what works in your institution. Ideally, an infusion is great because that's particularly good for perfusion because you have a steady state and then you can apply the high mechanical index or flash impulse and clear out the um, microbubbles from the myocardium and then watch for the rate and the extent or volume of, a, of replenishment. And that actually can equate, it does equate to the uh, myocardial blood flow. And the, um, the ability to do infusions uh, really depends kind of like what your technique is as well. Um, if you're doing a, a treadmill study, it might be a little more difficult to do that. If you're doing a, a bicycle study, it might be a little easier to do a continuous infusion. And I know that's how some institutions do do it. Um, most of uh, the experience that I've had has been with dobutamine, and so you can uh, do it also, or, or a vasodilator, regadenosone, for pharmacological stress, and there you can set up a continuous infusion at the same time. But in a busy stress lab, you may not be able to do that. And so, just as Kristen was saying, if you're going to give contrast before the patient steps off the treadmill, I usually give a bolus in that case, and just in the way that I say it's akin to kind of to a nuclear study, like you know, as if you'd inject the isotope, but you're mm -hmm. going to inject instead the, um, the contrast microbubbles. But in that situation, we're really focusing on LVO, right? Um, so that uh, you will be able to get better wall motion. If you want to have additional perfusion information, it's really tough to do it in an exercise treadmill setting. And you're much better off to go to a bike and have that continuous infusion and yeah. have the time to have the steady state to do the high MI impulse and then the mm -hmm. flash. Or similarly, if you're doing a pharmacologic stress and you have that steady state. But that said, you know, um, you can certainly do it with a slow, what, there's the intermediate thing too, where you could do a slow bolus injection, kind of replicating a hand infusion. And there's, you know, another institution that that's their method that they use all the time and it works for them. So um, if you really want to be quantitative, you must do an infusion. Um, and, uh, but if you want to be practical and clinical, you can get by with a, a bolus or a slow hand infusion, uh, replic uh, which is kind of a slow bolus rather, <clears throat> excuse me, replicating an infusion uh, for perfusion. When do you do it? 
you, you want to make sure that you've uh, seen your wall motion assessment initially, particularly if it's um, a treadmill study, and get your wall motion information, and then you do your images, your grabs for your perfusion. If you're in a, a pharmacologic stress study, then you can be doing it along the way, and as Kristen mm -hmm. implied, you can get the pre-peak images, which will often show you a perfusion defect before you have a wall motion abnormality. So I hope that kind of covers it. Um, did I miss any points, Kristen? Help me out there. Um, practical <laughs> practical I think, aspect. I think that was very clear. And actually, one of my my questions always was, what do you get first? You know, when you have that minute post stress, like you know, besides the pure panic that's going through you, trying to get all the images before, you know, the timer runs out. You get your quad screen. You pause the protocol, and then you can do any kind of flashing of the myocardium that that you need. Really, um, is probably the best technique. Yeah, you really want to make sure that you've got the regionals in that first you know, period of time. If you're doing a bike, like, a, sorry, a treadmill stress. If you're doing a bike, you've got time because you're yeah. able to combine and you've, if you, then you really want to have the infusion because then you can combine doing both the LVO and the perfusion. You've got more time to be able to be imaging. Mm -hmm. You can have the patient, you know, kind of hold that stage or, you know, progress or as, as you go. So it's, you have a little bit more uh, to work with. But a treadmill... Yeah, you know, you're going to go for LVO and regionals as your number one thing. Mm -hmm. Unless they're coming for a hemodynamic study, which is a whole other story. Then you probably don't want to use contrast if you, because you might accentuate, you know, the Doppler signal if you're yeah. looking for a hokum or, you know, that type of thing. So uh, you have to really be focused on, you know, what it is, is the main information that you want from that study. Mm -hmm. It can be most helpful. You know, with the increased use of contrast studies recently, uh, do you think that it should be part of a quality metric for accreditation was another question that came in. I thought it was an excellent question. I would love to hear um, the panelists' opinion on that one. Yeah, so I mean, uh, it de it's definitely helpful when you go through accreditation, right? They want you to be using contrast. They want you to have policies in place for this. Um, is it required to use contrast to be accredited right now? No. Um, but when we are doing our quality assurance part as part of our accreditation process, um, and we grade the sonographers on the performance and their technical performance of ECHO, they do get graded on if they uh, appropriately use contrast or not. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not required yet, but I think that it should be. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the ASC, everybody has shown that, that, it's safe. There's no reason not to use it. If you don't use it, you will miss something. You will miss a clot. You will miss a wall motion abnormality. So um, yes, it should be part of the quality metrics. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would like to amplify what uh, Kristen said, and and indeed, as she, as she clearly reviewed too, the IAC uh, requires that you do have a uh, plan for utilization of contrast in your lab, um, and if you don't, then you have to have some, you know, I mean, they give a backup clause kind of thing, you have to do something else you're going to do. <laughs> well, you know, really, that's, that, you know why we did that? That was probably now 10 years ago, I think, when that first came out. And I remember when we had this discussion at one of the Chicago bubble meetings. And it was like, I remember Dr. Feigenbaum standing up and saying, well, you know, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? So um, <laughs> we, it, it, was, um, it was very important and to get a foot in the door to say that contrast is required for a quality approved lab. And that was really the foot in the door to get that kind of back out clause. But really now another decade has gone by and we don't need that back out clause anymore. I mean, everybody should have. And I know that when uh, at the IAC, when they are looking at the studies that are sent in, um, if they don't give contrast, they're, um, they're docked. And it, it, if at least there wasn't a recognition that contrast should have been given or there was something else done. So it, it does impact. I just, in the last moment that we have, I just wanted to make out, um, make a shout out before we closed about a wonderful resource, um, particularly for um, sonographer training. And we've just developed this and it's been an intersocietal um, uh, project that we've had and we've organized it through uh, ICUS, Inter uh, the International Contrast Ultrasound Society. And if you just go to ICUS, um, 
Society.org, I think is the uh, website. You just look up ICAS and it's there. Um, and there's called a Sonographer Hub uh, curriculum, Sonographer Curriculum Hub. And there are actually modules. We've looked at everything, all the data, all of um, more so the presentations and um, uh, documents that can support building a sonographer curriculum, which is focused on training in ultrasound enhancing agents. And it actually applies to body imaging as well as to uh, cardiac imaging, echocardiography. So I would just, it's brand new and it's a really great resource and it pulls together a lot of um, resources uh, for our uh, training program so that our sonographers will be more comfortable uh, using this technique and it covers the gamut from um, you know, basics uh, right through to uh, perfusion imaging. So um, just uh, check that one out if you have time. It's, 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 it'll, it'll save you time. I just posted the link in the chat for anyone uh, who's interested. Um, Thank you, Pervy. <laughs> No, I great. think that was great. Um, I, I think one of the, you know, if we look at any guidelines, one of the indications for any other modality is when you cannot obtain pictures uh, via echocardiogram. And, you know, contrast is right there in the lab, easy to get. Patient is right there, get it done. And then you can, you know, um, see if uh, that doesn't work out, go to the next step. But I, I must tell you, I go to um, you know, many community hospitals have been around the country and, you know, there's still a lot of challenge even with the utilization of the contrast. And maybe it's the inertia of getting that IV in the patient or I'm not sure or the, you know, the confusion about reimbursement. But I think that uh, we have, uh, you know, those challenges uh, before we go to the advanced uh, use of contrast in perfusion um, and other avenues. Yeah, it's so true. You know, it just made me think of something there. It's sort of like uh, echocardiography is the gateway imaging technique. And I guess contrast is the gateway drug. I don't know, but, you know, you, you could sort of, um, there are a lot of, uh, and it's been shown in many studies that we can we can Im improve the uh, cost effectiveness of uh, non-invasive imaging and we can reduce the downstream cost of mm -hmm. uh, our patient care by utilizing um, ultrasound enhancing agents, which then you don't have to go on to the, the next technique if you can actually get the information uh, adequately at your first stop, which is usually, you know, first stop is usually an echo uh, when we want to know what's going on structurally in the cardiovascular system. I like to say too, I tell sonographers, do it right the first time. Do it while you're there. There's no reason to come back, have the, you know, the physician look at it and then say, I need you to go back and take more mm -hmm. pictures. I mean, what a waste of efficiency. And, and, and a lot of times that's not even going to happen. And really the patient then just got a really non-diagnostic test, which isn't fair. We used to uh, call that the, the struggle time, the struggle time, yes. right? That was the term. And if, uh -huh. you know, the struggle time is like, you know, like you're approaching a minute and, and, you know, it's not like the sonographer is not capable of doing the job as the patients are difficult and mm -hmm. there's a reason why. So if there's a struggle time that is exceeding, the other thing is what you said too earlier in your presentation, Kristen, is to have the ability for sonographer driven um, administration. If you, you know, you can't wait uh, to go and, um, you know, get approval for each patient to utilize the contrast agent. So it has to be in a, um, you know, a, a procedures and policies. And we have all of this uh, in the ASC uh, website. We did a, a, a big um, uh, basics of bubbles uh, session seminar, and that will be a link to in the, the sonographer hub uh, resources. So um, there's so much um, that if you just go and look for the resources that are there, they're really readily available and documented. But yeah, uh, let's not have any more struggle time. Let's uh, recognize that we're, we're capable, but there are uh, definite indications and let's enable our sonographers to make the decisions uh, to be able to optimize the studies and not waste time and not waste money and, and impact negatively on patient care. Yeah, and if you're also in an institution where you have to have a nurse to inject and sonographers can't, um, I always recommend uh, going to your apicals first. Don't don't even put the, put the probe on the peristernals. Go straight to apicals, four, two, three. Do you need it? Do you don't? Do you not? Because then you can notify the nurse. Now they've got 30 to 60 minutes to, to figure it out and, and get it to you. If you wait until you're in your superstral notch and you're at the end of your study and then you press the nurse call button, you're waiting sometimes up to an hour. And then what if they don't even know how to do it? So really the earliest start you can get, the better. So just determine if you need it right off the bat. 
That's great advice. Absolutely. I think early recognition and it will help us, you know, overcome some of these barriers, um, at least in terms of time and efficiency for our sonographers. So um, I can't believe that it's over. I feel like it just flew by um, this hour. I, I wanted to thank all of you for, for participating. I think it was very, very great. I have a long list of questions that we didn't get to and perhaps we need to do a part two because I mean, it was just so great. Um, so thank you all so much. Our next lecture is going to be on October 4th. It's going to be focusing more on pediatric echocardiography. So I encourage you all to join us. Um, so thank you again and have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Good night.